Okay, let's get started. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our program today. I hope you are all staying cool and dry. Tonight, we are so delighted to be hosting a very special program where we will be taking a behind the scenes look into the woman behind the beloved All of a Kind family series. The book uh, we'll be discussing this evening from Sarah to Sydney, The Woman Behind All of a Kind Family is the first and only biography about the influential author. And tonight, we're not only celebrating the life of Sydney Taylor, but we're also celebrating the life of the author of this biography, June Cummins, who sadly passed away from ALS before the book was completed. Her friend and historian, Dr. Alexandra, Alexandria Dunitz, who is speaking this evening, helped June complete the book. And we will also be joined by a surprise guest at the end of Alex's presentation. Now, before we begin, please take note that we are offering live captioning this evening. You can turn this feature on by clicking on the CC button at the bottom of the Zoom screen. It's powered by AI, so please excuse any typos. And we also encourage you to ask questions in the Q&A box throughout the program, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Now, after 14 months, the museum at Eldridge Street has finally reopened to the public, and we are offering both self-guided and docent-led tours, so I hope to see you in person soon. And finally, I just want to mention that the All of a Kind family books are truly near and dear to our hearts at Eldridge. And that's why we are offering an All of a Kind family walking tour for families later this summer. And we'll be strolling through the story into the streets of the Lower East Side to discover the spots where Ella, Henny, Sarah, Charlotte, and Gertie played, prayed, and purchased pickles. And you can sign up on our website. So Alex, please unmute yourself and turn on your video and take it away. Okay, this is fantastic. Okay, I'm going to move to share screen. It may take me just a moment to do that, and then we will get started. So one moment. Do this. Okay, and I'm going to. Okay, so if one moment. and Alex, you okay. just have to start sharing your screen when you get a chance. Okay, I thought that I did, Sophie. Yep, um, just at the bottom of your screen, it says share screen. Okay, hang on a second. I thought that I managed to do that. I I apologize here, everyone. Um, I did share screen. I did that. I did share. And, Excellent. Okay, okay, so we can see and your now desktop gonna, now. Now I'm going to move that over and perfect. here we go. Are we good now? Yes, perfect. Okay, there's always one button, button I forgot. <laughs> I apologize. Okay. All right. Now we can get started. All right. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity today to speak about a project close to my heart. After Sophie Lowe contacted me about speaking, it occurred to me how completely fitting it is that we have all traveled virtually from wherever we are, our kitchens and living rooms, our bedrooms and offices, here to the museum at Eldridge Street on the Lower East Side. In some ways, just like readers of all of the All of a Kind books continue to travel imaginatively from wherever they are to Sydney Taylor's Lower East Side. Today in our minds, we have entered a venerable building steeped in history, one reinvented for modern American life by hardworking visionaries firmly grounded in Jewish tradition. Similarly, Sydney Taylor used her imagination to transform her experience as the child of immigrants into children's literature that helped families, both Jewish and non-Jewish, think about what it means to be a modern American and a modern American Jew. When my dear friend, the late Professor June Cummins, taught a course at San Diego State on children's literature in the late 1990s, she was surprised to find so little information about Sidney Taylor author of the beloved All of a Kind series. 
The more she discovered about Taylor, the more she felt the story of this remarkable woman needed to be told. And now her efforts have appeared in From Sarah to Sydney, the woman behind All of a Kind Family, published just two weeks ago by Yale University Press. What I would like to talk about today is how the biography came together, how June transformed the massive amounts of information she gathered about Taylor into a compelling story. I will address two main questions. First, what did June discover? in her research over two decades. Of course, I would like you all to read the book, so I will not go into every detail of Taylor's life, but I would like to step back and reflect on why Taylor's story is worth telling. What drove June to devote so much of her time and intellect to this book? My second question is, how did June go about it? How does a scholar find out enough about another person in order to tell a convincing story? As a scholar of the medieval Islamic world, I was sometimes bowled over by all the personal information that June unearthed. That sort of documentation being almost non-existent for the times and places I normally study. Furthermore, June's sources were in English, not in some medieval or Arabic or Persian bureaucratic script, and they were often by writ written by men and women with beautiful clear handwriting or typed, although we did have to decipher a page of shorthand. Even more disconcerting, because I was not used to this type of research, was how invasive it seemed to look so deeply into a person's private life. But the connections between the personal information we uncovered and Taylor's books for young people made the project into a literary detective story that drew me in. While discussing June's work as a scholar, I will say a little bit about my involvement in the project. As some of you are, as, as Sophie just mentioned, June was diagnosed with ALS in 2015, and she passed away in February of 2018. That too, while deeply saddening, shaped how June's initial curiosity resulted in a fine piece of scholarship, and I would like to share with you the nuts and bolts of our collaboration. So first, why was Taylor's story worth telling? She is known today primarily because of the classic All of a Kind series. How important can five children's books be? Not a famous politician or social reformer, not a theologian or founder of enduring Jewish institutions, Taylor nonetheless engaged in extraordinarily important work, even if it is often overlooked. That is, providing engaging stories for us to tell our children about the past. June argued that not only did Taylor transform her childhood experiences into critically acclaimed literature, but she thereby helped transform American Jewish identity. Born at the beginning of the 20th century and starting to publish exactly at its midpoint, Taylor both reflected and shaped American Jewish national identity through her writing for children. In doing so, she bridged a cultural divide and made Judaism interesting, familiar, and knowable across the country. Taylor's semi-autobiographical books exemplified complicated issues of identity because their author's life was rich with the possibilities of being a Jew in America. Here, let me give you a sketch of Taylor's life. Born in 1904 to an immigrant family on the Lower East Side of New York, Sarah Brenner was the third of what became a family of five girls and three boys one of whom died as a toddler. The girls are familiar to Taylor's readers for the eponymous family of the series includes five sisters, each two years apart, dressed alike by their fastidious mother and looking all the same, all of a kind. The other four sisters all had names that are the same in the books and in their real lives. Ella, Henny, Charlotte, and Gertie. But the real life Sarah changed her name to Sydney at age 14. Her mother, Silly Brenner, identified with German Jewish culture, 
while her father, Morris, came from a traditional Galician background. Taylor attended public schools in Manhattan and the Bronx through the 10th grade, worked as a secretary after leaving school, belonged to the Young People's Socialist League for a time. There she met and eventually married a pharmaceutical student who, with his brother, eventually developed the company Caswell Massey into a multi-million dollar business. She acted with Lee Strasberg and danced with Martha Graham, had a daughter, Jo, a woman to whom June and I owe much gratitude for the success of our project. Taylor served as resident playwright, theater director, and dance instructor for young campers at one of the oldest Jewish culture camps, Sedgwin Camps in Port Jervis, New York, a job she kept for over 30 years. By 1950, she seemed to be a typical immigrant success story, embedded in family, interested in contemporary culture, and financially secure. Her life changed unexpectedly that year when her husband, Ralph Taylor, saw an announcement for a children's book award and, according to some versions of the tale, without telling his wife, sent off a manuscript of stories she had written about her childhood. That manuscript won the Charles W. Follett Award for Best in Children's Literature an award established by a Chicago-based publishing company as a public relations tool and a way to attract quality writers for children. Taylor won $3,000, a significant sum at the time, and even now nothing to sneeze at, and a book contract. She went on to write four more books in the All of a Kind series, as well as a book based on the memories of a friend from Sedgwin, a papa like everyone else, some easy readers, and numerous short stories. She remained close to her family, traveled extensively in Europe, and died from cancer in 1978. Thus, until Taylor was 46, in numerous ways she represented a norm, a working woman from an immigrant family, shaped by her mother's attachment to German culture and her father's artistic skills, absorbing the ferocious work ethic of both parents. Like millions of Jewish children, she attended public schools in New York and, like many of her peers, left high school before graduation. She started working while still a teenager and participated in the leisure and cultural activities of her peers. She belonged to a socialist youth group, but that was an activity shared by many Jewish teens in New York during this time. She was a disciplined dancer, but not an extraordinary one, a hardworking camp employee like thousands of others across the country throughout the 20th century, a Jew educated in a traditional familial Judaism with an abiding interest in Jewish life and in Israel, but with few traditional religious practices as an adult. All of that seems unexceptional, even if it is interesting and resonates with many of our own personal family stories. So while Taylor's life was extremely well documented, one could reasonably argue at this point that her life wasn't unique enough to merit a biography. Maybe an article in an academic publication or a family memoir, but not a full length scholarly work. But June realized that what made Taylor worth studying was the success of all of a kind family because its success revealed in a complex human way, important themes in American life. When the book appeared in 1951, it wasn't just a coup for its author. It was perceived as groundbreaking. It was the first book about ordinary Jewish children living ordinary lives to be published by a mainstream publisher. That is not a Jewish press focused specifically on the Jewish market, but a company that marketed to all American children and their parents and to the influential market of school and public libraries across the country. Immediately praised and highly successful, that book and its four sequels published over the next 25 years introduced millions of Americans to Judaism, forging a bridge through literature that moved Jewish characters and themes from the margins of children's book publishing 
and American culture at large into the national arena, enlarging the public's understanding and increasing its acceptance of American Jews. To give you some perspective on how important the All of a Kind series was, let's think for a moment about mid-century Jewish children's literature. In 1947, Fanny Goldstein, librarian with the Boston Public Library since 1913 and founder of Jewish Book Week, had published an article in the Jewish Book Annual of the Jewish Book Council titled The Jewish Child in Bookland which discussed Jewish books for children and included a nine-page inventory of what was currently available. Her Jewish-themed reading list, dominated by Bible and holiday stories, shows how few books of fiction with leading Jewish characters existed. Almost all were published by Jewish presses. Through the 1950s, Goldstein contributed an addendum of three to five pages to the annual, and in 1961, she published a slim 36-page pamphlet, The Jewish Child in Bookland, a selected bibliography of juveniles for the Jewish child's own bookshelf. She included a few works of historical fiction in which Jews play peripheral roles, but stories about ordinary Jewish children are absent until the all of a kind books appear. For comparison, Linda R. Silver's Best Jewish Books for Children and Teens, a JPS guide published in 2010, fills 375 pages. The All of a Kind series was pioneering in initiating that extraordinary change. It appeared at just the right moment when the market for children's literature was growing in the post-war period, and editors realized that telling inclusive American stories promised increased sales. It was not a given in 1951 that a children's book featuring Jews would be published, and certainly not that it would be published by a mainstream press. Taylor later recalled how wary the editors at Follett had been about the book's Jewish characters and themes. They instructed her to speak of the immigrant and the newcomer in the book talk she gave for publicity. In the 1970s, she said, especially in the light of present day's overwhelming concern with minority groups, it may be difficult for many to comprehend what courage it took for Follett and Company to publish my first book many years ago. Though they believed in its value, they were still concerned that given prior knowledge of its contents, the Christian world might shun it. In the beginning, all mention of the word Jewish was avoided in their blurbs and in their advertising. I was cautioned to say the newcomer or the immigrant when referring to the Jewish inhabitants on the Lower East Side. She recalled how she was guided to speak about the origins of her book in ways that avoided her and her daughter's interest in stories about Jewish children, focusing instead on her daughter's enthusiasm as an only child in hearing about her mother's big rambunctious family. Taylor went on to say that she could not understand, quote, why everyone was running so scared. After all, children are children first, and being Jewish, Black, or Puerto Rican should be secondary. The world moves along in many diverse routes, but children are endowed with the same capacities for happiness and sorrow, the same fears, or whatever. But to return to my first question, do those slim, all-of-a-kind books make Taylor's story worth telling? June convinced me, and I hope her book will convince you, that the answer is yes. Through the lens of their impact on Jewish identity, Taylor's life took on deeper significance. For example, looking at something as seemingly small as Taylor's conscious choice to change her name at a young age, we see that it was emblematic of several intertwined issues, among them Jewish identity and artistic identity. Much later in her life, Taylor claimed that she changed her name when she joined an acting troupe in her early 20s, but her diaries reveal that she changed it significantly earlier. 
Letters she received as a teenager show that her friends and relatives tried hard to address her as Sydney or Sid with an I or Sid with a Y, but sometimes, not surprisingly, slipped and referred to her as Sarah. This confusion of names and the identities attached to them persisted throughout Taylor's life. The editor at Follett had to ask the as yet unknown author whether they were a he or a she. And even long after the author's death, children continue to send fan letters to Mr. Taylor. Taylor's decision to change her name emerged from her idealistic plans to make a mark on society. She was determined to be different, a self-made American woman. In terms of artistic identity, at the time Taylor made the name change, she also began keeping a diary and was imagining and inaugurating herself as an author. As she became an actress, a dancer, and a writer, she kept the name she chose as a teenager for her developing artistry. The name change expressed a hunger for growth and self-transformation typical of second-generation Americans. Her husband, equally ambitious and equally determined to forge an identity for himself, also changed his name. Like Taylor, a child of immigrants, Reuven Schneider transformed himself gradually, first into Ralph Schneider and then by the early 1930s settled into being Ralph Taylor, Taylor being the English equivalent of the Yiddish Schneider. But we must not romanticize the immigrant experience, and certainly not Taylor's. The discrepancy between Taylor's childhood and how she presents it in her books was a compelling reason to pursue this biography. What people remember about Taylor's books is the warmth of the all-of-a-kind family, where children have adventures that most children can relate to. A lost library book, sharing crackers in bed, making a game out of chores, a disastrous attempt to cut a toddler's hair, something my older daughter did to one of her younger brothers to make him handsome, she claimed, learning to tell time, the excitement of a wedding or fireworks on the 4th of July, blending the unusual and the ordinary with humor, wit, and affectionate rendering of character Taylor made her readers aware of Judaism as something worth knowing and not strange. Adult readers, both Jewish and non-Jewish, who remember reading Taylor's books always exclaim with passion that they loved them and frequently say they enjoyed learning about Jewish customs from them. I cannot count the number of people who, when hearing of June's work, had a similar story to share about a mother or an aunt or a grandparent. Taylor's all-of-a-kind family books had the same effect when they were published. Children wrote to Taylor through the years, telling her how their mother or grandmother loved to read the books with them because they recalled how just such an episode happened to them, or how exciting it was to shop in the hustle and bustle of Rivington Street with Yiddish all around. Adults wrote to her too, thanking her for bringing that lost world back to life and allowing them to share it with their families. They could relate to Taylor in the same way that young readers often saw themselves in at least one of the five sisters in the books. An adult reader, however, also picks up on the poverty, the terrors of polio and scarlet fever and tuberculosis, and the dangers of children running under carriage horses in the crowded streets of the Lower East Side, or setting themselves on fire with coals from the stove. In the books, adults protect children and model honesty, patience, and dignity. Those hints at the more difficult and dangerous aspects of immigrant life came from Taylor's experience, and the real-life stories were heartbreaking. From Silly Brenner's, that is, Mama's, unhappiness at immigrating to the United States in 1900, her increasing despair as one pregnancy followed another, leading to attempts at abortion and suicide, the death of a toddler son, her loathing of the dirt and disorder of her apartment building, to Morris Brenner's grueling work in the rag trade and several failed business ventures. The stresses on the family were overwhelming at times. 
Then there were complications specific to the family. Tanta's incestuous relationship with her brother, her unhappy marriage, and mentally handicapped son being among the more arresting. Again, when these stories have come up in conversation, I have been amazed at the memories they have triggered. A husband's cousin in a scandalous relationship, the rumors about a neighbor, an uncle who died in what was then called the Spanish flu. The fact that Taylor's books contain dark episodes at all was not a given. Readers would have noticed that in 1972, when the fourth book in the series, All of a Kind Family Downtown, came out, that it took place in 1913, five years before the events in the previously published book, All of a Kind Family Uptown, published in 1958. Written immediately after All of a Kind Family, Downtown had been rejected in 1952 by Taylor's editor at Follett, Esther Meeks, in large part because it dealt with dark themes, poverty, orphans, and death. Times had changed by 1972, however, and what was considered acceptable reading for children had changed with them. The script from Taylor's book talk about All of a Kind Family Downtown laid out her views about the darkness of the past. To the immigrants settling in this great land, the new world represented a great adventure and the utmost in promise for the future. This despite the grinding poverty, the prevalence of disease and overcrowding, the harsh conditions in the sweatshops, the exploitation of child labor, Yet for the child himself, reared in such an environment, it was merely the way of life accepted as a matter of course. All around him shared similar circumstances, so there was really no basis for comparison. Even an occasional frightening occurrence in the neighborhood left him scarcely touched. The astuteness of Taylor's artistic vision was proved by the enduring place the All of a Kind series carved out for itself in children's literature. All of a Kind Family is still in print, and all the books in the series have been reprinted by different presses within the past 15 years, the first with a foreword by Francine Prose, twice a winner of the National Jewish Book Award, and those reprinted by Lizzie Skernick with forewords by June. The series can be found on the shelves of public and school libraries and in bookstores across America. To this day, Taylor's books participate in the national conversation about Jewish culture and identity. I read with interest the comments attached to the online review of From Sarah to Sydney in the New York Times that appeared two weeks ago, noting how almost all the contributors, both Jew and non-Jew, considered the books a memorable introduction to Judaism. The books continue to link Jews to non-Jews, as well as linking contemporary Jews to those of previous generations. The millions of people who read her books as children stand as witnesses to the vital importance of children's books in the transmission of any kind of ethnic culture, but specifically of Jewish culture and the preservation of ethnic heritage. To turn now to the second part of my talk, I would like to discuss how June discovered so much about Sidney Taylor and the publication of her books. The biographer needs to know not just the details of a person's life, but how those details fit into the history of that person's time period, its educational, cultural, economic, religious, and political history, among others. As one would expect from a university professor, June turned to scholarship for every aspect of Taylor's life. The wave of immigration through New York from 1880 to 1920, tension between German and East European Jews, tenement life both with its suffering and dynamic optimism, the growth of an American educational system, the importance of the relatively new phenomenon of the public library, heavily influenced by Andrew Carnegie, anti-German feeling during World War I and its effect on libraries, the new woman that emblematic figure who went with like-minded women to work in massive numbers, had earnings to spend and a new sexual freedom, 
Jewish socialist movements, the role of Jewish women in modern dance, dance magazines, experimental theater in New York, progressive schools such as the Little Red Schoolhouse and the Bank Street School, the spread of American camping and its importance to Jews, Jewish soldiers in World War II, a number of Taylor's relatives fought in Europe, the explosion of children's literature after the war and the role of women in the publishing business, lesbianism in the pre-civil rights era, Jewish American attitudes towards Israel, assimilation, changes in Jewish religious practice and communal life. For every detail in Taylor's life, there was a context. It was our job to understand that context and to see if and how Taylor fit. While all of that academic analysis, analysis, which drew upon the research of many excellent scholars was necessary, June's research really took off when Jo Taylor Marshall, Taylor's daughter, opened up to her the treasure trove of materials in her basement. There June found scrapbooks full of photos and newspaper clippings, journals and letters galore, and even the actual dress Sarah Brenner sewed for her graduation. For several summers in the 2000s, June returned to Joe's house in New Jersey to learn more about Taylor. Other members of the family were also generous with their time and memorabilia. June went on to interview family members, younger brother Jerry Brenner, his daughter Lori and son Charlie, Irving Brenner's widow Ethel, Gertrude's daughter Judy Magid, Henny's daughter and her husband Harriet and Sheldon Schaefer, Charlotte's daughter Susan Baker, as well as Ben Schlamm's daughter Rhoda and several very kind Sedgwin alumni such as Susan Adelston, Judy Pregall, Janet Weisenfreund, and Beryl Lang. Susan Baker shared a copy of her mother's unpublished memoir, Touched with Fire, as well as an image of the astounding paper cut Morris Brenner made as a teenager. June was also able to listen to a lengthy taped conversation between Ella and Charlotte made soon after Taylor's death. June and I went over and over the various taped interviews as we fit new pieces of information into the puzzle of Taylor's life. Another tremendous resource was the Curlin Collection at the University of Minnesota, one of the world's great children's literature archives. Established in the 1940s, it contains more than 100,000 children's books, as well as original manuscripts, artwork, galleys, and other materials for almost 2,000 authors and illustrators. The collection solicited the manuscript for All of a Kind Family in late 1967. Esther Meeks never responded to Taylor's inquiry about donating the original manuscript, but in the spring of 1971, it was still on Taylor's mind, and she pushed Follett Publishing, where she then had a new editor, to transfer the manuscript to the Curling Collection. As June knew, and I discovered, Taylor donated much, much more. June had gone to Minneapolis in the early 2000s to do research on a specific aspect of the editing of the first All of a Kind book, namely how Taylor and her editor wrangled over the degree of assimilation the family should demonstrate, which resulted in the inclusion of the chapter on the 4th of July celebrations. As our work progressed, it became clear to me that a return visit was necessary. June had mentioned that there was a lot of material she had not been able to examine because of time constraints. I will never forget June's wide eyes in July of 2017 when I said I would go to the collection to see if I could find some answers to the questions we had about Taylor's life. Nor will I forget my dismay when I saw the library cart with some 18 stuffed document box boxes waiting for me in the special collections room. Taylor had donated book manuscripts, fan mail, personal and business letters, financial records, passports. It was overwhelming and I was tempted to put my head on the table and howl. I had allotted two and a half days for research, choosing those days when the collection was open until seven rather than its regular five o'clock closing time on other days. Fortunately, 
unlike when June first visited and had to have Xerox copies made of pages she thought were particularly relevant, I had the advantage of that wonderful invention, the cell phone camera. As soon as I realized that I would never be able to read all those papers in great detail, I sat at that table for 11 hours straight, day after day, not even taking a break for lunch, turning pages like mad, and taking photos of anything that might be remotely interesting to June. I just tapped and tapped and tapped and tapped and turned page after page. When I returned to Evanston, I went through the photos, arranging them by date and taking brief notes of the contents. Then June and I had the fun of reading through those letters, piecing together Taylor's life at Sedgwin, her mother's last years, Taylor's interactions with family members, publishers, librarians and rabbis, and much else. One question I have been asked is how June and I work together, and this is a good point to talk about this. Before 2015, June worked as a professor at San Diego State University. She spent two decades commuting between Chicago and San Diego, a story in and of itself, carrying a full teaching and advising load, pursuing her research and participating in conferences, often in a leadership role, and raising a family. Her interest in the commercialization of children's literature led her to write thought-provoking articles on subjects ranging from Harry Potter to Disney's Beauty and the Beast. And she was a popular speaker at conferences and libraries. She and I met in 1992 and immediately became friends. Two of June's boys were classmates with two of my children, and our families frequently carpooled and celebrated together from family simchas to Thanksgiving and Passover. Before she got sick, June had done a great deal of research and had written a rough draft for several chapters of the biography. Once her disease progressed so that she could no longer commute between her family in Chicago to her teaching job at San Diego State, she devoted herself to the book. June gradually lost motor skills and she could no longer type or speak after several months. Her husband set up for her an eye tracking device with which she could speak and give dictation. It looks very much like an iPad and is calibrated to the user. June would look at successive letters on the electronic keyboard on a stand in front of her wheelchair and the device recorded what she saw and could speak that recording. Now don't for a minute think that this was easy. It's not the simple equivalent of typing with your eyes. When I accompanied June and her caregiver to the polls for the presidential election in the fall of 2016, I messed around with the device while June was being set up to vote and my admiration for her, already great, increased exponentially. Granted, the machine was not calibrated for my eyes, but stay on a letter too long and you end up with a line of Q's or Z's. The struggle to focus on just the right letter for just the right length of time was an exercise in frustration and the effort to delete the inevitable gibberish exhausting. And June did that day after day with graceful persistence. What the eye device could not do was allow June to write a lengthy document or include footnotes. So I started walking over to June's house most afternoons to help with the project. At first, I was primarily a typist. What June wrote on the eye gaze, I typed into a computer document. The next day, I would read back to her what she had written, she would edit the material, and then we would move on. Sometimes she wrote a paragraph, sometimes two. I would often run upstairs to her office to retrieve a file or check a source. In the early stages, I could hold a book or letter in front of her so that she could read it. But as time went on and her vision suffered, I read them to her. As you can imagine, two friends poring over fascinating material are going to bounce ideas off each other and try to answer questions together. With my background in history and June's in literature, the project benefited tremendously. She made connections to the all of a kind books that I never would have come up with while I was able to expand on the historical context. Now, when people hear that I am a historian of medieval Islam, they often stop short. 
How can you possibly be qualified to work in 20th century American literary and Jewish history? What a gamble for Yale University Press. Thankfully, everyone there was completely supportive of what must have seemed like a quirky project. And it's a valid question. But I remember a professor on my first day of graduate school looking around the seminar table and saying, you all are going to devote the next few years of your lives to becoming historians. What does that mean? I walked away from that class with the understanding that being a historian means mastering a set of skills, asking purposeful questions, gathering and assessing information, and then telling a plausible, meaningful story. And it is that understanding that enabled me to help June. June was always so grateful for anything I did, but honestly, I really got caught up in the thrill of the chase. A historian is a detective, and persistence and good luck sometimes lead to just the right clues. When we were working on the section about Taylor's career as a dancer, June mentioned to me how important her husband Ralph was to the creation of Dance Observer, an influential monthly magazine published from 1934 to 1964 with Martha Graham's friend and collaborator, the pianist and composer Lewis Horst. June also said how surprised she was that Ralph's name never appeared in scholarship about the mid-century dance world. Not only did I track down a dancer's memoir that told a dramatic story about the magazine's origins, but we discovered that Northwestern University, just a few miles from our homes, had a fairly complete set of the magazine. I did a little victory dance in June's family room when I came back to her with scans of pages with articles by one R.T., introduced as a young student of the dance, and of the masthead of issues in 1934 and 35, where the executive secretary was one Sid Brenner. However horrific June's disease was, and I cannot even begin to describe the brutality of ALS, I want to be clear that June and I really had fun. Her face would light up when she sensed I had made a really nifty discovery. For example, when I found the memoirs of Alix Landobriatov, Ralph's cousin, whose relatives in Latvia were murdered during the Holocaust, who herself survived the Holocaust as a child in France, and whose parents exchanged visits with the Taylors in the 1960s. And we didn't just have fun with the biography. One week, we took a break to see the newly released live action Beauty and the Beast starring Emma Watson and to write up a review that June had been asked for. One afternoon, a close friend of June's from graduate school, now a professor of English in Chicago, brought over his madrigal group, and we were treated to a performance of Renaissance music. Some things June never got a chance to see, but she was always on my mind as I tidied up loose ends in the biography. For instance, we knew that Jerry Brenner donated to the Veterans History Project collection at the Library of Congress the letters he and his wife wrote to each other during World War II. Since our sources for the early 1940s were a little thin, we hoped that they might fill in some blanks. June rightly felt that a visit to those archives was not a priority given the limited time she had to work. But in May of 2018, I spent three blissful days in the archives in Washington, D.C., again from the moment the library opened until it closed. The halls of the library are so beautiful, the staff was so welcoming and helpful, and the archives are so well organized and presented that it was a researcher's dream. When I write my checks to the IRS, I wish I could put in that memo line for deposit at the Library of Congress only. By this time, I was an old hand with the cell phone camera, and I zeroed in on any mention of family members, as well as of Jerry's experiences, specifically as a Jewish soldier. I had listened to June's 2007 interview with Jerry, and here it came to life on the page. Jerry and Norma were 24 and 22, with a three-month-old baby daughter, when Jerry joined the Army. 
They wrote to each other every single day from when he went to boot camp in December of 43 until his honorable discharge at Fort Dix on December 30th, 1945. He had gone to France, where he fought in the Battle of the Bulge, and on to Germany, where he attended synagogue services with Holocaust survivors and translated in occupied towns, a job he hated so much he eventually stopped mentioning to superior officers that he knew some German. Norma, meanwhile, lived in a small apartment in the Bronx with her parents and baby daughter, with all the stresses of wartime on the home front. It was so poignant how they protected each other from distressing news, keeping up a brave front through battles and domestic tensions with the true story only being hinted at long after danger was past. I could go on and on about the scholarly and personal satisfaction that our collaboration gave to both June and myself. I hope you have learned a little about why Taylor's story is important for an understanding of American and Jewish life in the past century and how it became important in the friendship of two curious Jewish women scholars. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you so much, Alex. Uh, that was, I loved the images that accompanied um, accompanied your presentation. So now I would like to bring on our special guest this evening. I'm going to ask her to both unmute and also start your video. Uh, our special guest today is Joe Taylor Marshall, the daughter of Sydney Taylor. Um, and Joe will be joining us to talk a little bit about her own memories and recollection of working with June um, and just her own thoughts about uh, how it's impacted her and other families today. So Joe, I'm clicking on the unmute button, so feel free to just click on that button in the middle. And I'm going to ask you to start your video now. Perfect. Hi, Joe. Hi, how are you? Oh my gosh, I am so moved. Alex's presentation was fabulous. She knows more about my family than I've ever known. Uh, and I would love to see her victory dance. And I was so <laughs> impressed that at the Curlin collection, she didn't eat lunch. I mean, that would be really for me a, a sacrifice. Uh, I want to thank all of you for being here today. I wish I could thank you in person and for your interest uh, in my mother's books. Um, it's really super. I wish that uh, she were still here to uh, appreciate it, but I'm sure she's looking down from above and smiling. Uh, I have known June, I guess, for close to 15, 20 years. Um, it feels like forever, and I wish it had been. June was incredible. Um, I want to start by talking a little bit about the background uh, of the books. Um, through the years, I had received multiple requests um, to dramatize uh, the All of a Kind Family series. One lady even sent me a, uh, a story of a whale she had written to prove what a good writer she was. And all I could think of was, was the whale Jewish? <laughs> I don't know, but at any rate, um, when June contacted me, she was the first person who had ever said, I would like to write about your mother's life. And that really impressed me. So we drove out to Pennsylvania somewhere where she was hauling out there. And um, I was so impressed when I talked with her, when I met her, when I began to read some of her material not only with the historical uh, implications, but the emotions that were in the, the feelings that were in her writing. And uh, I thought, you know, all those dusty boxes in our basement that I just thought were dust collectors. And for those insiders who know the books, I would say there were not even any buttons hidden in my dusting. Um, <laughs> I thought, well, maybe she'd like to see some of these things. They were stacked up so high. So June decided to come and visit. And we took her down to the basement. And what I thought were dusty 
collections of boxes she thought was the treasure trove that Alex talked about. Uh, I just couldn't believe that um, she would go through and spend the time going through all of this material. Not only that, she was extremely kosher. I have limited Jewish knowledge except for what my mother has written. So I didn't know much about how to maintain a kosher home. So we ran out and got tuna fish. I never ate so much tuna fish in the years that June was there. And finally, I got so sick of it that I said, let's run out and get Hebrew national hot dogs. They have to be kosher, the answer to a higher authority. So out we went and we got the hot dogs. She would not touch them. <laughs> she was glot kosher, which I learned was the highest form of kosher. So back it went to the tuna fish. I think you could date how many time she was with me by discarded tuna fish cans. <laughs> anyway, uh, she did at research at least eight summers, maybe more. And um, we found all kinds of things like that graduation dress you saw a picture of. I learned a lot of things I didn't know about my mother in the trunk. I had the trunk full of diaries. Uh, I just felt she had given me the key, but I felt it was too intrusive. I never opened it. So I turned the keys over to June and said, go ahead, go to it. Uh, I learned that that dress was a lot smaller than I've ever been. Um, <laughs> but I also learned a lot um, just through the fan mail that I received after my mother was gone. And I still am receiving it. And a lot of it is from boys, and a lot of it is from non-Jewish children, and some of it is hysterical. Uh, one little boy wrote, why did you write about five little girls? Why didn't you write about five little boys? <laughs> Another one said, dear Mr. Taylor, because as Alex said, they thought it was perhaps a man, uh, how did you know so much about the Lower East Side? Were there roads back then? And another one started off, I loved your books, but I would have written them different. So I wrote back, I try to answer every letter now. I wrote back, well, when you publish your different book, I would love to have a copy of it, see what you did different. I still haven't gotten it yet. Uh, I do want to say some more about um, the difficulties um, of my uh, getting along as an adolescent with my mother and as a young child, I was very difficult. Uh, I was something like, um, if you ever heard the fantastic score, there's a song called, why did they put beans, the kids put beans in their ears? Nobody can hear with beans in their ears. And they did it because we said no. Well, that was me. What my mother said, I said, no, I guess I was looking for my own way in life as most teenagers do. Uh, I wasn't, I was a brat <laughs> for a while anyway. I think I've gotten better, but who knows? Um, I also would like to say uh, a little bit about the, uh, the impact of, um, all the people that have written, not only have a cotton fan mail, but I got uh, a query from a male, non-Jewish producer of a firm called East Center Heights, who absolutely loved the books. And for 10 years, he's been trying very hard to get them made into a film or a TV series. Uh, we've been so close so many times. But there's always something, um, about 12 years ago, there was a writer's strike. We were just on the verge of uh, looking for screenwriters who could uh, translate my mother's work. Uh, and then the writer's strike hit and that uh, nixed that. Um, but I'm thinking now with the emphasis on diversity uh, that maybe there'll be less interest in vampires and dragons and maybe more of going back to uh, other cultures and other times and more innocent times. Um, 
it uh, there's been so much lately, so much interest. Um, the uh, New York Times Review, of course, which is absolutely magnificent. Uh, in my dream, somehow, I'm walking down the red carpet getting the Oscar for the movie that's been on yet unmade. Um, Rich Michelson has written a, uh, a picture book for little kids, and that's coming out next year. It's called Sidney Taylor, One of a Kind. And the premise of the book is that you can be anything you want to be if you're a little girl. You can be an actress, a writer, a dancer, a poetess, a musician, anything you want, because my mother was all of those things. Uh, and also a, uh, uh, a book about two heroes by Jackie uh, Davies is coming out. Um, the, there, it's about two little boys who are heroes and she, one is named Sydney and the other is named Taylor uh, because uh, she said she absolutely loved the books and that was her tribute to them. There was also an article in the Jewish Week. And um, of course this program sponsored by the Eldridge Museum is, is absolutely wonderful. Uh, at least Alex's part was. <laughs> Um, there are also uh, many unpublished plays my mother wrote, uh, original plays that were produced at Sedgwin with her acting as director. Uh, and Ella, who was very talented musically, uh, wrote the original music. I still can sing some of the songs. I'm sure you wouldn't want me to, but those are in the attic, not in the basement. So you don't have to climb down, only up if you're interested. Um, there's no more room in the basement anyway. Um, just some anecdotes that are kind of funny. Um, I, I went to our local library and I wanted to give them a gift of my mother's books. And um, I went to the librarian and I said, uh, these are my mother's books. And she said, oh, no, 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 we don't take used books. I said, no, 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 my mother wrote the books. Oh, she said, <laughs> I thought that was kind of funny. Um, also, another fun anecdote uh, concerning the book. Uh, an acquaintance of mine said, oh, what a gorgeous picture of your mother. And then he followed that up with, you must have taken after your father. <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, he, I, actually, I, I saw very little of my father. He was uh, glued to developing the drugstore, Caswell Massey, uh, during uh, the war. And uh, I, he was almost busy 24 seven. So as for my mother, um, I often felt overlooked and surpassed by the many careers she was so devoted to. Um, however, despite my, my rather strained relationship at times, um, she was indeed a wonderful mother to all the children that she wrote for and, and who have devoured her wonderful books and still are doing so. I get letters now from grandchildren of the, the original readers. Um, I also am very grateful for the gifts that she gave me, uh, which are really uh, very special. The love of arts, of music, of poetry, of dance, of theater, uh, and of most of all, of talented writing uh, and talented writers. And I'm hoping her legacy will live on as such. And thank you so much for inter being interested in this program. Thank you so much, Joe. Uh, to our audience members, please, this is uh, a now a moment for you to, to ask any questions that you might have for both Alex and Joe. We've had a couple of comments come on in. So while people put in their questions, I will read some of them. Someone said, I just want to say that I'm 63 years old and that the All of a Kind family were the most influential books I've ever read. And when I read about the Sukkot celebration, I told my mother I wanted to have a sukkah. And she said, no one does that anymore. 
And I thought then at seven years old, when I grow up, I'm going to have a sukkah. And I did and still do. And that led to further observances. And today I have three from, from birth grandchildren who can be directly traced to all of a kind family. That was really sweet. Thank you so much for that comment. Uh, another comment here from uh, Paul Zielinski. He says, this is not a question, but I want to say something about the picture book I illustrated based on the All of a Kind family books written by Emily Jenkins and the titled, it's titled All of a Kind Family Hanukkah, which I presented to second graders in New Orleans Ninth Ward, telling them the story and showing them my pictures. I began by telling the children about Dr. Rudine Sims Bishop's concept that the books can be windows or mirrors for children looking at the world in children's books themselves to see themselves or to see other people's lives. And after I read and showed them the book, I asked the children if they thought of this book as a mirror or a window for them, and they all voted for a mirror. And that is what children's literature can do, the humanity of humanity. I think that's a really um, sweet message there from Paul Zielinski, which I will say I read many of Paul Zielinski's books when I was growing up. So this is very special for me to, to have him here tonight. Um, a question here. Since Sidney Taylor was a dancer and teacher in addition to being a writer, how did she feel about being known primarily as an author? Was she comfortable being seen this way? I, I guess I can answer this. I. Uh... You know, when she was a dancer, she was very happy being that. But as she got older, it was a little more handy <laughs> to be an author because you could sit. <laughs> uh, and I think she was happy in every career that she endeavored. Uh, you know, she was multi, multi-talented. Alex, did you have something you wanted to add to that? Yeah, I was just going to say that when she won the Follett Award, um, her excitement and the i mean she it was like i just keep pinching myself that this is really happening this it, she really was it it was such um a boost for her as a sort of a a validation of what she thought was important so i think partly because of seeing what kind of impact she could have. I was certainly not aware of any sense of regret. Oh, I wish I had done that. I wish I had done that. And then also the thing to remember is that at Sedgwin, she was helping little girls learn to dance year after year. And she was introducing them to theater. And one thing is she actually did keep up with acting in a sense because she had been very influenced in the 20s um, by, I think it's called psycho psychodrama. psychodrama. So one of the things is she actually talks about this, how she was at a visit in a library and she had read from her book and she said, I could tell the children were getting a little restless and there was still time to go. So I did what I do with kids at Camp Sedgwin. And I brought a couple of them up and I had them act out an episode or like if you had lost a library book, what would you do? And she and there are photographs of her just so intensely involved. And I think that for her to introduce children to drama was deeply satisfying. So to me, all those aspects of her life, she kept up with dance classes her entire life. I just think that she wasn't making artificial distinctions like you're either a dancer or you're a failure or you're this or you it was that the arts are essential to life and you do what you can do well and i and i and i that at least that was my impression yeah i i quite agree alex i think uh she was comfortable in every skin that she wore and it was all a part of her being I just have to say her enthusiasm was a little dampened when she called her mother to say, mom, congratulations, you're, you're in my book. I won $3,000. No, first she said, I am getting my book published. And grandma, her mother said, so how much did you win? <laughs> uh, speaking of Sejuan, we've had 
many, many, many people who've written in the Q&A box just about how much uh, they loved Sedgwin. Someone said, I went to Sedgwin with Sid Taylor. She was a fantastic lady and we all loved her. These books I are my cherished say- books. A hello to all the Sedgwinites. I just, I love you all. Hello. (laughs) And someone else said, I am who I am because of Sid and my experiences at Sedgwin and our relationships as I grew to be an adult. So wonderful memories here. Uh, Some of of the people have some questions about about the illustrator. I'm taking it as the iconic book cover. Is there any, can you share any information about this? Either of you? The first illustrator was named Helen John. And what was amazing was she never met personally with my mother. She apparently had been injured in some sort of disfiguring accident. So she didn't allow herself to be seen. But all of her description, her, her illustrations of the Lower East Side were done through my mother describing the vendors, the Charlotte Russe cones, the hot sweet potatoes, uh, what the tenements looked like, and they were flying back and forth letters. But my mother could never get to meet with her, which was very unfortunate in a way, because my mother, we loved the original illustrations. The new illustrations though are very updated to reflect the time that we're in, but they still, I think, capture a lot of uh, the family spirit, you know, including Paul Zelensky's. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't have a chance to talk about you, Paul. Paul did the uh, illustrations for Hanukkah, and I have a poster that he did, and I went to have it framed in our local shop. And the framer, when I came in, said, oh, Where did you get this? Everybody's been asking for it. So that was really nice to know. And let me just add that we do have the correspondence in the beginning with uh, Taylor and her editor, where her editor said, you know, if you go to this place in New York, I want you to look at the sketches for the drawings. And just if there's anything that doesn't look quite right, you know, just point them out so that they can be adjusted. And so there were certain things about whether you know, the father was wearing a kippah while in the home. And, and, you know, there were certain little details. But um, I, my, again, Joe, she was your mother, but she struck me as a very detail-oriented person and extremely fastidious. And I got the impression that the editors were, after a while, going to say, we found a great illustrator and she did a great job or they did a great job and you'll just love it. And they didn't really give her the opportunity to check the illustrations before publication because she would, every single little detail, she would say, well, this this sister looks a little too old for the book or this, and she had lots and lots of just little things to say. And uh, so, I got the impression towards the end, it was, well, thank you for your input, that's great. And uh, we think you'll really like the book the way it comes out. And we just have time for maybe one or two more questions. Uh, Some people have been asking about uh, the other siblings, the other sisters. And actually, Laura says, this isn't a question either, but I'm Charlotte's granddaughter. I'm 53 years old and I remember meeting on Sid when I was 10 and I was 10 when she passed away and I was so sad and I loved her and she wrote me letters and now my own children ages 16 and 19 have the entire series and are as proud to be part of the family as I am. Oh, well, that's lovely. Absolutely lovely. Yeah, Susan's daughter. So uh, let's take a look. Any final questions or final things that Alex or Joe, you want to tell our audience members. Um, the book is, is has been published and is available. It's on Amazon. And uh, Joe, you mentioned to me over the phone the other day that it was already sold out after the Times article. Yeah, I'm amazed at that. It's on back order at Amazon. But I think I think it's in back in stock now. Oh, is so it? Anyway, oh, good. Yeah, I, I believe good, so. Because they, they made me wait. <laughs> Oh, okay. But any lasting, uh, lasting thoughts? 
Well, I would just like to thank everyone who participated today and was here. Um, and I just constantly, it's just the warmth of everyone's support is just wonderful. Yeah, the, the wonderful questions and the wonderful comments will live in my memory forever. So thank you also from me. Thank you so much, Alex, and so much, Joe, for being here and sharing the memories of both uh, Sydney Taylor and also of June Cummins. Um, I know some of you have sent over wonderful messages that we weren't able to read out loud, but rest assured, I will send your comments over to both Alex and Joe so they'll be able to see it. Um, and I hope to see you all here next time. And don't forget, we do have the all of a kind family walking tour that's coming up uh, later this, actually later this summer. So sign up on our website and you can learn more there. So thanks everyone and stay healthy and stay safe. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you all.